Let's talk about mappings or transformations. Um, the setting here is that we've already thought a fair amount about a function. One kind of function was from R1 to R2 or R3 or even Rn. And that's a curve. And a good physical model is the motion of a particle. Okay, and we've got velocity and curvature and all kinds of interesting geometry there. Okay, so that's kind of done, although there's lots more we could say. We've also looked at functions with more than one input, but only one output. Function of two variables, whose graph is like a surface, or you could do a contour plot to just use two dimensions, or from R3 to R1. Same deal, but now you have three dimensions. Maybe you look at the level surfaces. Okay, and so that's the stuff where we have the gradient, we have partial derivatives, all that kind of stuff. What we haven't done very much of yet is a function from more than one input to more than one output. So the simplest case would be like from R2 to R2. It's taking something in a plane to something in a, a different plane, or sometimes you can think of it as the same plane. I'll talk about that. Um, something R2 to R3 taking a plane and kind of hopefully kind of curving it in an interesting way and putting it inside of space. That'll create a, what's called a parameterized surface. Or maybe R3 to R3. That could be like a transformation of space or maybe a different coordinate system on space. We'll talk about that. Or even in general, Rn to Rm. We'd really like to at least touch on the general case. What is it, What happens there? And um, we actually have touched on that in linear algebra. We know at least some of the story of what happens when this is a linear transformation that can be represented by a matrix. And in fact, the whole heart of differential calculus is that you can, uh, if you know, understand that, you understand any function pretty well or any differentiable function pretty well. Okay, so that's kind of a mathematical setup. Is it, it's natural to start just putting in multiple variables for inputs and outputs. What about physical models for that. Why would we be doing that like in an application? Well, this word mapping is a clue. For example, a map takes um, some surface, it is a correspondence between some surface and a, a piece of paper. So let's say we have, we think of a map as a map from R2. Suppose I look at a point on the paper map And then there's a correspondence to the actual physical world, the surface of the Earth. And that's, let's say, you can think of that as sitting in three-dimensional space. So here's the paper map. And here's a point in that paper map. And we've got that should correspond to a specific point on the surface of the Earth. And so that's why this word mapping is often used for this more general kind of function. It's really just a synonym for a function but it's suggesting this sort of geometric use of, of things, okay? So that's something to keep in mind, and we'll actually look at exactly that case of taking a surface and using it, or a, a plane and using it to describe the surface of a sphere, and we've actually already almost got all the technology from sp discussing spherical coordinates. Another example is more mathematical that we've already been doing for years now is polar coordinates. Again, here's one way to think about that that's not really how you think about it usually when you're first introduced to it. When you're first introduced to it, usually you think of one single plane and two different grid systems on it. Turns out that to phrase things carefully, it's really helpful to spe separate out things a little bit. Here's the reality and with the, con with the usual xy coordinates drawn on it. That's the real plane. And I want to describe a point in that plane using something other than the xy coordinates, using r and theta. And I want to have some place where I keep track of all the r and theta numbers. And so I'm just going to draw another plane. And the kind of weird thing is that I'm going to put r here and theta here just as if they were Cartesian coordinates. So these actually are going to be Cartesian coordinates in this other plane. So this is like a formal place where we just kind of do bookkeeping and keep track of the r's and thetas. And any time you have a pair of numbers, the best way to just formally bookkeep that 
uh, geometrically is just to put, a, put them as Cartesian coordinates. And so polar coordinates turns into a transformation between the formal bookkeeping space, the plane over here, and the reality. You don't have to think of it that way, but I, f I find it helpful. So uh, one thing is that we don't need r less than 0. Remember, in this class, we never use r negative. And um, this transformation, let's call it t for a transformation. Um, that's another synonym for a mapping or a function of this type. Is going to be something that course takes the r's and thetas to the x's and y's. We actually have a formula for that. We know that the formula is that if you give me r and theta, I can produce the x and y coordinates of the actual point in a fairly simple way, They're just r cosine theta, r sine theta. So for example, if r equals 2 and theta equals pi over 4, that corresponds to the point where r is 2 and theta is pi over 4. You can't read that pi over 4 very well, huh? Uh, in other words, this is root 2 and this is root 2. And so every point over here is going to correspond to a point over here. We'll come back to that example, but I wanted to just give you another example that you've already really been using, but this is a, a more sophisticated way to, to do the, to keep track of things. We have a separate xy plane and an r theta plane. Okay, so those are two examples where you've got sort of a formal thing, like a map, a paper map, or the polar coordinates, r theta, and reality. That's one use of this mapping idea. Another uh, thing is more about the transformation word, some sort of action. And so, for example, a rotation of the plane. We could take x and y, the x and y plane, and we could just rotate it. Now, I could draw that with an arrow just pointing back to itself and think of it as the same plane. But I always want to have this same idea of place where the inputs live, place where the outputs live. And most of the time, we're not going to worry about if you can actually identify those. And so in fact, I'm just going to, let's put like x prime and y prime for the coordinates of the output, because it's going to be useful to have coordinate, have names that are different to uh, symbolize that. So suppose we look at a transformation that's a rotation. We have done this, because this is a linear transformation. If this is 1, 0, let's say it's a rotation 90 degrees counterclockwise, to be simple. 1, 0 is going to end up at 0, 1. And let's do it in red. 0, 1 is going to end up at minus 1, 0. And for example, um, 2, comma 1 is going to end up at um, minus 1, comma 2. OK. And so everything has been rotated around 90 degrees. So that's something where it's a little bit of a different feel. You're really thinking of these are both reality. That's just the picture of reality before the transformation. And this is the picture of reality after. These are just interpretations. It's all the same mathematics. But it's nice to, to kind of have those kinds of in, um, intuitions. OK. So that's one where we actually have thought about it quite a bit from the linear transformation point of view. And one more example, and I'm actually going to do this one in detail. Let's say I have input coordinates u and v and out output coordinates x and y. u v space over here. And so in other words, t of u v equals u plus v, u minus v, where that's equals x, y. Or I might even want to write it in terms of column vectors. Let's see if I can fit it in here. T of u v equals. If I want to be really careful about how it fits into like linear transformations and matrices, because this is a linear transformation, then I might want to write it in terms of column vectors. OK. So how do we picture this? Well, for linear transformations, there's definitely some shortcuts, because we know it can, has to take lines to lines and parallel lines to parallel lines, parallelograms to parallelograms. Um, but let's try to not use too much of that and uh, think about how we would do it in general. Well, what you can always do is you can look at a point on the input and look at the single point it goes to. You can also look at a point in the output and say, where did that come from? 
Now, it might just be a single point, might be two points, might be a whole curve, might be a lot of things, depending on what's going on, okay? You can also do the same thing with, um, like, a line or a curve. Look at what that goes to over here. Probably it's going to be some sort of line or curve, unless it's a special kind of case. You can also look at, well, what if you look at a line or curve here? Did that come from some line or curve or something more complicated over here? Okay, so those are both very useful, and it turns out that going the backwards direction is going to be the more crucial for us when we use this in terms of changing variables and integrals, which is one of the big applications we're going to use it for. So let's look, let's look at that here. So the points, you know, we could look at like 1, 0, for example. 1, 0 goes to just 1, 1, and we just plug in 1 and 0 into here, okay, and 0, 1 goes to uh, the, the user 0, so you get 1 minus 1, okay, so that goes over here. And let's see, what about 1, 1 in blue? That goes to 2, comma 0, oh, that's interesting. And of course the origin, oh, let's have the origin in black. The origin goes to the origin because it's a linear transformation. And linear in the strong sense that there's no constant terms here. That would be called an affine transformation. It would involve a translation. This guy doesn't involve any translation. Um, okay, so that's examples of points. Well, points, you'd have to, you have to plot a lot of points, unfortunately, to get a lot of bang for your buck. Let's draw some curves. Well, simple curves are probably best to start with, unless you have some clever idea. What about the, the u-axis? So remember how we do that. We can think of that as a parameterized curve. We can think of that as u equals t and v equals 0. So in other words, we got all the points of the form t comma 0. That gives us a very explicit way to describe the geometric, in terms of algebra, the geometrics that we're doing. OK, we just plug that into here. What is t of t comma 0? You just plug that in. And I chose this not, not because it came to me, just because it was simple, because I wanted to use it. And then so that's just t comma t because the v's were 0 and the u's were t. Oh, OK. So not surprisingly, it's the straight line. The output of this guy is the straight line going this way. Let's suppose we did this one. That would be 0, comma t, and the inputs for u and v. What, that, what does that go over to here? Uh, it's getting pretty busy, isn't it? That goes to t, comma, minus t. Aha. Not surprisingly, it's this line. I'll use red. So that red line like that turns into this red line here. Similarly, uh, if you did, for example, 1 comma t, not too hard to figure out that it goes to this line over here. And again, this is a linear transformation. So once you get a, a little bit of a feel for it, you can use these theorems we have that lines go to lines, parallel lines go to parallel lines. So for example, this guy must go to this guy. OK. so. That's going, taking stuff on the inside input to the output. Well, what if we had um, another situation? It's getting way too busy, so I'm going to have to I'm going to erase everything. But yes, I'll end this video pretty soon here. Don't worry. But let's suppose we had um, something on the output side, and we wanted to describe it in terms of where did that come from under this transformation t, OK? So what if we had some, uh, some line over here, let's say uh, something simple. Let's say y equals 1 over here. Now, <clears throat> really important thing is I used, when I pushed forward through the transformation, I used a parametric description. So when you push things forward through a transformation, it's that explicit parametric let's create stuff kind of description that's useful, the t comma 0. When we go backwards through a transformation, it's the implicit description that's best. And I might say more about exactly why that. There's a very elegant reason why that's true. Um, but let's look at this as in terms of an implicit description. If this is y equals 1, you can see from the equations why that might be useful. Oh, I know y equals u minus v. An equation about y immediately gives me an equation about u and v. And as long as I'm able to deal with implicit descriptions of curves and things like that over here, I've got it. Oh, u minus v equals 1 
Okay, so u is just one bigger than v, or u equals, uh, sorry, v, let's just put it in a slope intercept form, v equals u minus 1. And so it's got this intercept here, and it's just a line like that. Okay. And so that's a really nice thing to know. If you're doing pushing things forward through transformation, you use parametric descriptions. If you're taking them backwards, you're pulling them back, you use an implicit description. Okay. Um, that's a place to stop this one.